midpoint of the tribulation by the time we get to chapter 12. Uh, John is, uh, has taken us through uh, a timeline of events that will take place in terms of uh, seal judgments, and the last seal judgment opens up the, the trumpet judgments, and we arrive at, a, again, the precise timing that Daniel gives us is three and a half years uh, to the midpoint of the tribulation period, and um, uh, several uh, horrific things are going on around the planet in terms of God's judgment uh, upon uh, the planet. But also there's a worldwide revival uh, that's going on, and there, there are, are tens of thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands of people uh, that are coming to faith in Christ. People, every, every people group, every language on the planet, everyone will have the opportunity to hear the gospel during, during that time period. But uh, in the middle of it, then, there's a, there's a kind of a pause and break, and John gives us some more details, which in a sense is is kind of a, a relief. We can take a break from studying about demonic armies that are wiping out half the population and so forth as we had a few weeks ago. Always hoping for a lot of visitors on those messages. But um, uh, anyway, it's a, it's a challenge to, uh, to really teach through this as we, we've seen, uh, you know, the one episode of uh, the angel gives John a scroll and he eats it and it's the prophecy. It's what's going to happen in the rest of the period of time and it's sweet in his mouth. Because uh, it is. Prophecy is. We lo- uh, I think people will get excited about it. We love to, we love to know what's going to happen in the future. We, know that we love the, the accuracy of, of God's word, the uh, empirical intellectual evidence that it, it is completely reasonable for us to place our faith in this book as being inspired by God because God exists outside the time-space continuum and he can then speak into the life of a prophet and tell things with exacting detail that will happen in the future. Um, I love that. That's sweet in the mouth. Again, what happens to John, though, it's sour in his stomach, because in this case, because of what what the prophecy says, uh, because of this horrific judgment that is coming upon planet Earth. So we're in the middle of the tribulation. Some of the things that we've looked at uh, have already spoken about things that were taking place and kind of culminate. Uh, and uh, we're going to see here something happens in the middle that will have an impact as we continue on uh, in our study in the second half of the, uh, of the tribulation. But uh, back in Genesis chapter 12, we have the call of, uh, of Abraham. Uh, and uh, ever since then, Satan has known that it would be through the Jewish people that the Messiah would come. Uh, he knows right away from the beginning that there would be a Messiah after the fall. But now it's narrowed down. The Messiah will come through. To Abraham, it was said, and through your seed, you know, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And so ever since then, you know, Satan has been persecuting and coming after the Jewish people because he's a student of Bible prophecy and he knows the Bible very well. If he can prevent the Messiah from coming, he can continue his rule and reign in terms of being the prince of the air uh, of, this, uh, of this world. Of course, once Jesus is born, the next thing that will bring Jesus back to planet Earth, and we'll see that in Revelation 19, is this remnant of Jewish believers that cry out uh, as a nation and receive Jesus as their Messiah and as their Savior, and that's what brings Jesus back to planet Earth. So ever since that's been known and predicted, it's been everything Satan could do to try to again annihilate the Jewish people to prevent that from happening again so that his rule and reign might continue. And certainly we see that in the history of the Bible and we, and we, see, it, uh, uh, we see it lived out in, in, in current history as, as well. And that's continuing. Anti-Semitism is growing at, uh, at uh, alarming rates throughout, uh, throughout Europe, Western Europe in particular. And um, all, all uh, being fueled by misinformation and hate and so forth. We mentioned one of the things that is being propagated throughout uh, the uh, Arab world right now, for, for example, is that it's reported widely with many testimonies and so forth that the fact that in that uh, last intrusion into the Gaza Strip when the uh, Israeli Defense Forces went in to try to drive back and create a safety barrier to prevent the... Um, Again, Hamas from shooting their rockets into Staroth, and they've, they've got, uh, they have uh, missiles that will now go 40, 40 miles. Nasrallah and, uh, has them up in north. He's being supplied by Iran and Syria, and uh, large cities like Tel Aviv are now being threatened. 
And so they went in in uh, defense of their country proactively to do something about that. So what was reported then in the news of that is that uh, the reason that they did that is so that they could go in and capture and kill Palestinians so they could harvest their organs. And that's what it was all about. This is reported widely in the Arab press, television, and so forth. And then some European journalists have now picked up on that story and run those stories in, in Europe as well. And of course, if that's all you ever hear, you think, how could they do that? How horrific. And this hatred is uh, through false information is being built uh, against the Jewish people uh, around the world, and in particular, certainly in, in the uh, Islamic world. But uh, as we see in verses 1 to 6, it's a conflict of the ages, but here it's being portrayed in symbols. John gives us some uh, great insight into this cosmic battle. Now, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she, was, where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. So again, on a cursory reading, you might look at that and go, what in, what in the world are they talking about here? Uh, but, uh, but again, the Bible is a great commentary on the Bible, and, uh, and this is uh, very easily explained, to, and, uh, and it's pretty self-evident as we go through it. But uh, the first thing we note that it's, it's symbolism. It says that. Again, we try to look at the Bible as literally as possible, but when he says it's a sign, when it's a symbol, then that's, that's what it is. So these things are all uh, symbolic of something that is taking place or will take place uh, in the future. And the first thing we note is there, the woman who is a symbol is uh, really a, uh, is the nation of Israel. And uh, we'll see that as we look in our text. First thing we note that, uh, again, as I said, the, the woman is a great sign there in verse 1. Uh, it's the first of seven signs that will occur in the book of Revelation. We'll see that again in, in chapter 13, 15, 16, and uh, in 19. And, uh, and so we don't try to look at this as an actual woman. We know that she is a symbol of something else. Now, interesting, the um, Roman Catholic Church in, uh, in their doctrine has uh, always portrayed this woman as being uh, the Virgin Mary. And I don't know if you've ever seen any of the artwork of her being betrayed with a garland of stars uh, over her head, shining as the sun, uh, standing on the moon and so forth. I've seen it in statuary and in uh, stained glass windows and some of the, uh, some of the artwork in churches. Again, I, I built stained glass windows for about 20 years for a living and did uh, uh, lots of restoration with uh, some of the Catholic churches here. And, and uh, so I've probably seen a little more than, than most of you. I just want to add that uh, they, were, they, were about, they were some of my best customers. They were the only ones that ever said to me, are you sure you are charging us enough? They actually would say to me on more than one occasion, some of the restoration, I'd say, yes, I'm, I'm fine. They're one of the few groups that would bring me lunch, too, and, um, while, while we were working and stuff. Um, but uh, portrayed there because it's their understanding that this is not the nation of Israel, but actually, it's, it's the Virgin Mary. Now, Mary uh, Baker Eddy, the founder of Christian Science, says she's the woman <laughs> of Revelation 12 as well. And there's probably lots of other views that are, that are out there. But notice the woman is identified by her description. She's clothed with the sun. Uh, she has the moon under her feet. She has a garland of 12 stars on her head. And this is a, a direct reference to Joseph and his picture of the nation of Israel from Genesis 37, 9. You remember that Joseph is given dreams of his future, and he shares them. <clears throat> they don't go over real big with his, with his big brothers, uh, nor his father as, as well. Uh, again, verse 9 of Genesis 37 says, of Joseph, then he dreamed still another dream, and he told it to his brothers and said, look, I have dreamed another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, 
and the eleven stars bowed down to me. Now Joseph is the twelfth son of Israel, so he would be the twelfth star. So he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter, matter in mind. Now, of course, with Joseph, that actually happened. You know, he goes again. They, they uh, are not real thrilled with Joseph. He seems to get uh, special attention from their father. They throw him into a pit. He's sold into slavery. He's taken to Egypt. He's in Potiphar's house. He's uh, accused of a false crime of raping Potiphar's wife. He's thrown into prison. He happens to be there next, just happens to be there next to the as uh, someone said on a test that I was scoring one time at Genesis, the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker. That is not who he was in prison <laughs> with. But he did uh, interpret the dreams of, the, uh, of the, uh, uh, the person in charge of giving wine to, to Pharaoh, uh, as well as the baker and so forth. And, and then eventually, through those dreams and that interpretation, Pharaoh has other dreams. They send for Joseph. He interprets the dream, becomes the prime minister of the nation of Israel, and his father and mother and his brothers come and eventually bow down to him. The dream that God gave him was, was true. But it's a direct reference not to Mary Baker Eddy or, or the Virgin Mary. This is a direct reference. This image is the nation of Israel. It's a symbol, and it's a symbol of the nation of Israel. Notice what's happening to the woman or the nation of Israel. She is in labor pains, her cries of labor pain, and certainly at the... At the birth of Jesus Christ, he's the child. Uh, they were living under the heel of the Roman Empire, a military state, and, and uh, it was a very difficult time for their existence. The fourth thing is a woman's child will rule the nations. And uh, notice the, uh, I think the uh, translators get it correctly, giving a capital C to child. He is the Messiah who would come and rule the nations with a rod of iron. Again, that's a direct reference to Psalm 2, speaking about the Messiah. When he comes, God says, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break or rule them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. So again, if we just let the Bible speak for itself, it's easy to identify the woman as the nation of Israel. She's a sign, a great sign, uh, and the child uh, who will rule the nations with a rod of iron, who will be caught up to the throne of God, easy to identify as the, uh, as the Messiah. And yet again, a shepherd carries a, carries a staff with which he guides the sheep, and he carries a rod, and the rod is for correction. So that's always a symbol of correction and judgment. Uh, the fifth thing, the woman's child ascends to heaven. Same word, interesting, for John uses for the rapture of the church, to seize, to rescue from, from, uh, from danger. And so there's not a lot said. Again, the emphasis is not on uh, uh, Jesus uh, per se. It's on what's going on with the nation of Israel because it was through Israel that the Messiah came and what's going on with the fiery red dragon who is not the good guy in the story, by the way. That again, he is representative of Satan. And, and, and why is there this cosmic battle? Why is there so much anti-Semitism in the world? And what will happen to the Jewish people in the future? Um, that really has everything to do with what uh, is in the book of Revelation. And we're going to get some insights uh, into that in just a moment. But the child, the Messiah, Jesus, is caught up to God uh, in his throne. So uh, very easy to identify the child. There's a dragon Again, who's a picture of Satan. Revelation, again, 12, 9 makes that very clear. The color red is associated with death already in chapter 6. And, um, and Jesus tells us Satan is a, a murderer. And the point in terms of his being fiery red is, is Satan at this point is seen in, in, uh, in all of his, what we might say, his fierceness. Uh, the seven head, heads, the ten horns, represent the, the uh, form of the last world uh, empire. And, uh, and we'll talk about that more in, uh, in future studies. I don't want to digress too much uh, on that. But again, that same description is used of the Antichrist in chapter 13. We'll see that next week. And then in chapter 17, uh, it's used of the false prophet uh, again. And there in chapter 17, the description or those symbols are explained. 
But it's talking about his world dominion, his world rule. And he has these diadems, these crowns, meaning he has conquered. And uh, we know that during that tribulation period that is still yet, yet future, there will be the Antichrist that will be the final world ruler. And we used to uh, speculate into what that would look like. Uh, in terms of a revived Roman Empire, we use various names. Now we just say it's the European Union. We don't have to speculate to, uh, where it will come from, what it will look like. Uh, we, we, are, we live in, in those, those days of its uh, existence. And, uh, and of course, there'll be uh, Satan is the other part of the unholy trinity. He is energizing, giving his power to the Antichrist. And then in chapter 17, we're introduced to the false prophet who, again, is running the show in terms of this last world um, uh, religion that, that will exist. So any, anytime you have major world religions that for a number of years were in, in absolute opposition to each other, and now we live in a time when there seems to be a growing cooperation among them, and this concept that we can all get along if we believe that there's many roads that lead to God and so forth. And again, we live in those days. Uh, we have a sense that we're leading to a, a one world government as well as a uh, one world religious system that will exist during, during this time. Now, I was, <laughs> I was watching the, uh, the news uh, about a week ago or so, and I was watching a guy interviewed who is not a Christian, and this was not a Christian channel. It was just a uh, it wasn't part of what's called the lamestream media, I mean the mainstream media, but it was one of those, those other uh, channels that give you another, uh, another view. And a guy was being interviewed, secular guy, who was just an economist. And uh, he was talking about the fact of what's happening with the, U the U.S. dollar, things that are going on around the world in terms of the economy, uh, the concern over another trillion dollar debt that may come upon us with the uh, current health care proposal that a uh, uh, our Congress is, uh, is going over and considering that uh, at the current time and so forth. And he wasn't making a political statement one way or another. He just, as a guy that studies the economy, he was just saying, now, if, if this goes through, and then he mentions a couple of other things, the fact that <laughs> if you don't know, we don't have a, to do this. We borrow all the money from China. Like, we got a big visa card, and, uh, and China holds the, the, uh, the bank on all, on all that. Uh, China's very concerned. This is very interesting. China, a communist, socialistic government, <laughs> a week ago was, uh, was calling those in the power in our own country and they're saying, are you sure you want to move to that kind of <laughs> medical plan? Because it's, it's socialistic in, in its uh, very nature. And I thought that was interesting coming, coming from them. But they're worried about the money uh, in it. Uh, all this is going on uh, as we watch the news at night, which Man, if you didn't know the Lord, it could be very depre depressing to, to watch the, the news. But anyway, this, this guy says, well, I think what will happen eventually is that we'll have the, the economy will falter. There'll be a continually growing in debt. And the only way to, to work it out then, I think it's just the natural outcome, we'll then move to a one world currency. And that one world currency will be the driving factor between uh, basically like a, a a one-world type government, that, which is the only thing that can manage the crisis that we're in currently. Wow, I wish I had my videotape going and uh, uh, got that on tape. But uh, very, these are secular guys that are saying this. They've never read the Bible, the book of Revelation. Uh, they're just seeing the, the possible scenarios that are out there that we're currently living in. Interesting times, but all a part of this big cosmic battle. The third thing is there's a, the woman's child, again, as we've said, is a, a picture of the Messiah himself. And, um, and again, the conflict between Satan and the woman began back in Genesis 3.15. And so the dragon is, is standing. Now, a couple of things about this. There's, there's, two, Greek tents, there's two Greek words that are very interesting. When it, uh, and uh, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but when it says that Satan knew and Satan stood. They're both in what's called a perfect tense. It means it's happened in the past and it continues to have results right into the future. So Satan knew in the past the Messiah would come through the woman, the nation of Israel, and it's continued to have results in terms of trying to persecute, eliminate anti-Semitism and so forth. The other thing, he not only knew, but he has stood. He's been standing in a sense, waiting for her to give birth to the Messiah. 
uh, so that he can eliminate the, the, the Messiah. And that's the, uh, the point here. Uh, it, again, Pharaoh, again, had that, uh, attempted that. He is referred to as a dragon by Ezekiel, Ezekiel 29. Nebuchadnezzar is referred to, who, again, persecuted the Jewish people, took them into the Babylonian captivity. He is referred to uh, by Jeremiah, Jeremiah 51, as a dragon. Uh, and, uh, again, the emphasis is that Satan understands uh, Bible prophecy. When Jesus was born, Satan used King Herod to try to destroy him. And you remember killing all the babies to and under to try to make sure he got them all there in Bethlehem. Bethlehem was not a big city by any means. It was a small village, and this may have only involved uh, 10 or 15 or 20 or, or 30 babies or children, male, male children. But again, they were all killed by Herod as directed by, again, a spiritual entity or a force that is behind very often the world governments in terms of what's going on in, in the world then and in the world today because there's a cosmic battle going on with God's redemptive plan of history and what he wants to do in terms of bringing the Messiah and bringing the Messiah back again to planet Earth and Satan who is working very hard to try to uh, prevent that. So his strategy has always been to persecute God's people and in a sense devour them if he could. So the special hatred for the Jewish people is the power behind uh, anti-Semitism from the days of Pharaoh and Haman in the book of Esther to Stalin and Hitler that we've seen in our own lifetime. And by the way, it's a major stumbling block to Jewish people receiving Jesus as the Messiah because they, they, they have family, have read, know very well uh, all the stories about the Holocaust uh, and, uh, and, and their cry out of that is, where was God? You know, if we're, if we're God's... <coughs> You know, we kind of joke, and there's a joking line about, if we're God's chosen people, let him choose somebody else for a while. Uh, because they have suffered tremendously. This is why. This is why they've suffered tremendously. Because the Messiah came through them. Theirs was the covenant. Theirs was the promises. Theirs was the rights, as, as, as Paul says. Theirs was all the privileges. But with that has come a, a, a tremendous price that's been paid. Now, during the tribulation... Anybody that comes to faith in Jesus as Messiah, Gentile or Jew or anybody else is going to get persecuted. And for the most part, they're all going to be martyred for their faith. And we've already seen that early on when the Antichrist uh, takes over. But there's an especial hatred uh, for, the, for the Jewish people. In terms of, uh, of uh, again, this idea of a stumbling block, because part of the problem is, is that uh, they know that when those Jews were put in boxcars to be taken to their death, their Christian friends... Uh, that's, uh, that uh, live uh, next to them and their neighbors simply shut their curtains and, and look the other way. So it becomes very difficult. I don't know if you've encountered this. <laughs> I have becomes very difficult sometimes to share with Jewish people, which you would think would be very open to the gospel because Christianity is Jewish. This, we're we're the, the wild olive uh, branch, Paul says, that's been grafted on. They are the true olive branch uh, and we are nothing without them. And Paul even warns the Gentiles, be very careful, you know, because you're nothing without them. There needs to be more of an appeal made. But it's very, very difficult. How do you make the appeal if you're in that situation? Point out the fact that, yes, it was horrible and it did happen, but it doesn't prove that God doesn't care, that he's not there. What it does prove is, is how evil man is and there is sin in this world. And we all need to be saved from our sins. We all need re, uh, re, redemption. So uh, there is an answer, but it's very, very difficult. And the, the good news uh, is that, and I read very recently a, a documentation that uh, during that time period in the Holocaust, there were thousands of Jews that came to faith in Jesus Christ. That through a Christian, because Christians were persecuted as well. We're familiar with Corey Tim Boom and others that went to, uh, into uh, many of those camps and were a witness for Jesus Christ, led many to faith in Christ uh, uh, during that time. It's their Messiah. Many turned to their Messiah during that time and were, were saved. But Satan has a special hatred for the Jewish people and orchestrates the best he can world powers against them. We still live in those days, and those days are going to get much worse. So the conflict of the ages is really portrayed in the symbols, and the symbols are really easy to understand if we just look at a couple of cross-references in the Bible. Got a little war going on here now. 
the second part here. Satan is cast down after war in heaven, verses 7 and 9. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon of angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. I want to see this on film. <laughs> a cosmic battle of God's holy angels fighting against Satan and his, his fallen angels. Uh, and Michael, again, who we see in Scripture is, is, is connected continually to the nation of Israel, intervenes uh, and uh, has greater power. And Satan is finally cast out of heaven and he is finally cast down. Again, notice the fiery red color meant to reveal his character. Again, it was Jesus that said he is a murderer from the beginning. Paul says in 2 Corinthians that he is the God of this age. In Ephesians 2, 2 calls him the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So again, in terms of the celestial conflict, what, it's, what is it all about? Well, uh, it, again, it's very significant that Michael is involved. I think it has everything to do with the nation of, uh, of Israel. But one of the things that uh, is brought out by uh, David Hawking in his book, The Coming World Leader, and the coming world leader is Jesus Christ. <laughs> He's the one that's, that we're looking to to come. Uh, and in his book, he, he at least suggests this scenario. I think it's very interesting. We, we talked a little bit about it on Wednesday night. Now, keep in mind that Satan had to be cast out of heaven because he still has access there. We read in the book of Job that uh, Satan has access to, uh, to heaven, to God, and he is there uh, as the accuser of the brethren. And, um, and we probably give him a few things to accuse us for <laughs> along, along the way. And, uh, and he is there accusing us uh, before God's throne. Uh, remember, God says uh, to him, have you considered my servant Job? Of course, Satan's response was basically uh, a paraphrase. Yeah, I've been stalking him for a number of years and watching him very carefully, and I know exactly how to get to him. You let me get to him in this area, and he'll never worship you again. And that's what Paul says in Ephesians 6, that God has a very particular, specific scheme against every one of us. He watches and he waits, and he's very patient. Waited many decades before he allowed Bathsheba to appear on our rooftop before David. He waited and waited for the right time. That's why we need to be engaged in, uh, in this conflict in terms of putting on the full armor of God. But there's going to come a point in the time in the middle of the tribulation when this battle takes place and Satan is finally cast down. So what, what causes it? What causes Satan's last shot at an affrontal assault against God and his throne and his kingdom? Because that's what he wants uh, all along. And we saw that on Wednesday night in Isaiah 13, the I wills. He wants to be like the most high God. And certainly there are many false religious systems today. That's what they purport. What did he say to Eve? You eat of this fruit and you'll be like God. You'll have the knowledge of God. What does Hinduism teach? We'll teach you through rituals and so forth. You can become a God yourself. We, we uh, put Western clothes on it, teach it as the New Age movement, so you can become a God yourself. It comes over into Christianity and the faith movement, and you can become little gods yourself and speak your own reality. So th this thing is, is permeated. It's, it's basically Satan's main scheme and plan in order to deceive nations and, and people and, and, uh, and cultures around the world. But he finally makes one frontal assault, and he's kicked out of heaven for forever at, the, uh, at that point. And we'll look at some of the, uh, the you know, consequences of that uh, in a moment. But what uh, Dr. Hawking suggests is the fact that um, we don't often think of it. I've never thought of it or picture of it. We know that all of us will stand before Christ, beam a seat one day. We'll never stand before the great white throne of judgment. Uh, but if we've come to faith in Jesus Christ, we're saved, thoroughly saved by his grace and his grace uh, alone. And, uh, and we'll stand before Christ, though, and give an account for our lives. Again, that Bema seat is the seat at the Olympics where the rewards, you know, first place, second place, those, that thing those guys are standing on, uh, you know, in the Olympic ceremony when they raise those flags and play the national anthem, that is the Bema seat. That's the, the word there. We'll, st we'll stand there one day before uh, Christ to be rewarded or, or not rewarded for how we've uh, lived our lives here on planet Earth and dealt with the 
what we call the time, talent, and treasures that he's uh, entrusted us to. Now, I understand all that and that, and that image and everything. And, and, of course, we all want to hear the Lord at that point say, Enter now, my good and faithful servant. Uh, you've been you know, faithful with a few things. I'll now make you ruler over many. Uh, but at the same time, I never thought about the fact that Satan would be standing there watching all this and accusing us and saying they don't deserve it. He doesn't deserve that. She doesn't deserve that. The accuser of the brethren. Again, the rapture of the church, right? We're in, we're in heaven. This is midpoint in the tribulation. Satan still has access there. Never really, didn't really picture that in my mind <laughs> before. But, but uh, what uh, uh, David suggests anyway is that it could be that this just drives Satan crazy because he knows this as well as God knows this. And he can't really comprehend God's grace. He really can't comprehend God's, uh, God's love. Uh, and it may be the fact that in the end, when it's all said, and when God then presents us, the church, and we know from Scripture, uh, it's without spot, it's without, without blemish, it's without wrinkle. He presents us perfect because of his righteousness that he's given to us. It could be just like too much for Satan. He goes, this is it. I'm just frontal, frontal attack. I can't, I can't stand it uh, any longer. Uh, that's at least one suggestion is what uh, brings this this war in heaven uh, that we see here uh, all about and, and begins it. But whatever starts it, it ends with the war, uh, concludes with, with uh, the dragon or Satan being, being cast out of heaven. And notice he took a third of the angels with him. And again, uh, they are spoken of as stars, which is very consistent. We've seen that from the beginning uh, of chapter, chapter 1. So there's a conflict of the angels. It's portrayed in symbols, and we're kind of told about that, and then there's a little bit of a parenthesis here in what John is explaining. And he says, and oh yeah, you need to know this too. Satan is cast out of heaven, and there's some consequences to that we're going to look at now, but he'll get back to, okay, what happens uh, in terms of this, uh, this persecution against the Jewish people. But the next thing, the consequences, verses 10 to 12 Notice he says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. So there's some real pretty heavy consequences to, to in the middle of the tribulation, Satan and a third of his fallen angels being now cast uh, to, to planet Earth. And the first thing we notice is that um, consequences are seen in God's kingdom. Uh, there's a few people in heaven going, it's about time. <laughs> And they're apparently, they're kind of rejoicing. Now salvation has come. God's kingdom has come. Because uh, uh, they finally got this guy out of there. This thing is coming to a culmination. It's coming to an end. Satan knows he's only got three and a half years less left. Again, because he's a student of Bible prophecy. But uh, all of those in heaven know it as well. And they're, they're rejoicing. And, uh, and again, this is all an answer to when Jesus taught us to pray. He said, pray this. Uh, our Father who art in heaven, thy kingdom come and thy will be done. Both here on earth as it is in heaven, that's what's about ready to happen. Every time you've prayed that prayer, you're praying for Jesus Christ, Revelation 19, to come back and establish his kingdom here, uh, here on the earth. And heaven is rejoicing at this point. Consequences are also seen uh, in, in the church because we're told how the church who is in heaven at this time, as we've mentioned, how they overcame Satan. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, not loving their lives uh, more than God. That will be declared about us in heaven. Church, the church, church around the world, we don't always get along too well at times. But, uh, but, when, but that's not the end of the story. Uh, when we're in heaven, uh, it'll be a whole different thing. That's when we'll be seen, again, without spot or wrinkle or any blemish uh, at all. And what will be said about us is that the way that we overcame Satan in this life was by the blood of the Lamb. What does that mean? It means that Christ did everything to purchase our salvation, and we did nothing. 
It was all by his grace and his grace alone. It wasn't a ritual. It wasn't because you were baptized. It wasn't because you did this or that or ever uh, taught a Bible class or uh, ever did a thing for the Lord. It was all because of what he has done for us. Because sin left us separated from God. Uh, and it was only the blood of, of God himself that could save all of mankind. One man might die for another man, but only one man could die for all mankind, and it was God himself, Jesus. They overcame him by the blood and by the word of their testimony. Well, what's the word of our testimony? Well, that's when we talk about our failures and his faithfulness. <laughs> that's when we, t we talk about uh, uh, the times that we've blown it, but God has been so faithful you know, through, through the years. Certainly we have a testimony about how we came to faith in Christ. And, uh, and there's some glorious testimonies uh, in this church. And they're sitting right down there in that hallway today. They're those kids that are growing up knowing the Lord, walking with the Lord. One day they'll serve the Lord and uh, they'll, never, they'll never have a testimony like mine or maybe like yours. I have a horrible testimony. I was just uh, a horrible sinner and God finally... Uh, uh, got a hold of my life after I'd done many horrible things and did the best I could to ruin my life for a couple of decades. That's a horrible testimony. But those kids down there, some of them have uh, an incredible testimony. Uh, but again, a testimony of, of how we got saved, but we, we live out our testimony each, uh, each and every day. And I think it's so important that we, that we speak of, we understand the grace of God. And how did they overcome? How do you overcome? Again, I think there's insight. If that's going to be said about us in heaven, what can we learn about it now? I think we can learn that one of the ways that we can overcome Satan is by the, by the word of our, our testimony. Again, our failures. But God is so faithful. Do you talk to people about that? I think we kind of shy away from that sometime. <laughs> I got to, uh, there was um, at the wedding, and of course you do weddings, there's there's a mixture, Christians and non-Christians. And again, this is Kelly and, and, uh, and Garrett. Garrett's uh, stationed in Oklahoma now. They met while he was at Yokota in Japan. And she was uh, an exchange student there for a year and uh, met there. And uh, so it was just uh, fun to, uh, makes you feel very old. I did have to ask her, Kelly, I just need to know, did I dedicate you as a baby? Yes. Okay. I'm really getting old now. <laughs> dedicate him and then, and then marry him uh, 20 years later. But uh, it, was, it was a great time. There's always the non-believers there. And the guy that was doing the photography uh, works at Yokota, but he's like a Japanese national and uh, a professional photographer. So they, he came over to do the pictures and got to share my horrible testimony with him that was full of how faithful God was and his grace and to maybe help him understand why do we get excited about God? Why do we celebrate? Why do we worship? Because of his, his faithfulness. It's so... Uh, so important. I wish I could tell you it was, it was I always take advantage of those opportunities, but you know, we, we don't always, but apparently it's one of the ways, it's one of the ways that we overcome the enemy uh, in terms of living our lives for, uh, for Christ. I have to, how am I doing? I'll tell you another word, real quick story. Though. It doesn't always go that well. I remember one time when I was coaching baseball, we had uh, kids and I had a gal that was the team mom who was uh, just fantastic. Yeah, she'd feed the kids, take care of them, do all this stuff. And, and uh, we were, uh, uh, and mo half my kids were from Kailua, half were from Waimanala. Most of my practices were down there. Most of our games were down there when we weren't on the road. And I, I had uh, typically uh, 15 kids. I'd have two that had a mom and dad or at home. Uh, I'd have four or six that were being raised by grandparents because many of them had been killed in drug-related car accidents. I mean, you, you get to see what's going on and why there's so many angry young, young men out there in the world today. And we did the best we could working with them for a, a number, of, uh, number of years. But one kid in particular was just a bully. And he just kept picking on one, a couple of the other uh, smaller kids. And that just totally, uh, totally irked me. That was the only fights I ever got into in, in elementary school that was those kind of things. And uh, I, finally, um, <laughs> I finally grabbed it. It's not a good coaching method, but I finally grabbed, I was furious. I had taken this kid aside. I talked to him. I'd done timeouts. I'd made him run laps. I'd made him done push-ups. I'd benched him. I'd done a lot of things up to this point. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to justify my actions here, but just to a little bit. But he finally did something to one of these kids that I just couldn't take it anymore, and I grabbed him by the, 
by the shirt and then uh, lifted them off the ground. It's a little easier. You know, it's tough if they're 15, but when they're 10, you can still do that. And um, I said something about removing his head from his shoulders if he <laughs> ever did that a, a again and tried to say with enough force that he would believe me because I knew this kid had trouble believing anything adults said because he'd been lied to many times. So I tried to emphasize the truth of this uh, and put him back down on the ground again and still had him run some laps. And then the, the team mom, who is not a Christian, knows that I'm a pastor, came over to me and said, oh, pastor Tim, oh, I never knew you talk like that. She goes, oh, wow, you just like all of us, okay. Well, that was kind of okay, but it wasn't okay. Uh, because I am like everybody else. You're like everybody else, man. We still have a sin nature. We still blow it. And somehow at that point, I don't, rec I don't recommend this, but I, I could then begin to talk to her that, yes, I, I, I'm a failure at times, but God is faithful. You know, our testimony is not just the glorious things that we do for the Lord. We call that a bragamony. And, uh, and what overcomes the enemy is actually a testimony. Not only how we get saved and his grace, but how his grace sustains us. And, uh, and apparently that's going to be said about us in heaven. Uh, I think it's probably a key to helping us overcome uh, the enemy even, even today. The last one is a tough one, that we love God more than our, our own lives. Did you notice that? Jesus put it this way in, in Mark 8, 34. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeits his, his soul? Those can sound like harsh words unless you understand who it is that's calling you. Remember, Jesus is saying, this is what you need to do, but it's for me. It's for me and it's for the gospel. I've talked to... Uh, more than, a, more than a couple of, uh, of, of young guys in the military, and I've asked them about leadership and how things are going and how things are being modeled and whether it's good or bad or hard or whatever. And, uh, and sometimes you, when you get the, uh, the, yeah, yeah, it's good. I, I've, we've got great leadership. And, uh, uh, and, uh, I, and then you hear this phrase, I'd follow that guy anywhere. That's what Jesus is saying here. You know, in other words, if there's the integrity of what it's all about and the character, would you follow him? And Jesus saying, would you just check me out here? I think if you will evaluate things, if you think you can do it on your own and still keep it together, you're going to lose it. But if you'll actually come to me and lay it down and live for me and for the gospel, then your, your life's going to be saved. Besides that, what are you living for anyway? What profits a man to gain the whole world? Yet forfeits his own soul. It's a hallmark. It's a benchmark. When you went as a Christian, you get to the point where you, where you say, well, Jesus, wherever you go, I'm going to follow. Whatever you say, I'm, I'm going to do. That's when the Christian life starts to get exciting, actually, <laughs> because God will take you at your word and begin to use you and give you opportunities, and uh, it, gets, it gets exciting then. But those are consequences that are seen in heaven, spoken of by the church, and I think we can learn something of uh, this morning. Third thing, the consequences are seen in God's warning, and it's that woe, that woe word that uh, we've already seen uh, mentioned uh, earlier. And uh, this time, the woe in that word is like, whoa, it's like you should be scared to death. When the angels say from heaven during the tribulation, whoa, it's because you should be absolutely frightened out of your mind. And that word is used again here because Satan is now cast down with a third of the angels, and he's just a little bit ticked. And, uh, and uh, it's going to be it's going to be seen. The consequences of the war in heaven will now be seen uh, on earth. The fourth thing, uh, it's the birth of the child that brings persecution to Israel. A little bit of a reiteration, but again, kind of the continuing of the story that we began in the first section of the text, verse 13 to 17. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time, times and a half time, again, that three and a half years, from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth and the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, 
who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So again, the persecution is directed at the nation of Israel. Uh, again, the woman is persecuted by Satan. Why? Because she gives birth to the Messiah. And, uh, and now he realizes that the equation just changed. He couldn't stop the Messiah from coming, which he was trying to do. Uh, and now it will be all about to keep the Messiah from coming back. What brings him back is a remnant of Israel representing the nation that cries out, recognizes he is their Messiah. And when they cry out and recognize him and call up him, remember Jesus said, uh, looking upon from the Mount of Olives, looking on, on Jerusalem, he said, you will not see me again until you say, I am the Messiah. That's what he says. You will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, which is, a, that's what you say to the, to the Messiah. Well, they will say it uh, in the future. That remnant, the thing we're talking about here, Satan knows that, he understands Bible prophecy, uh, and he will do everything he can to go after this, this remnant. She flees into the wilderness, again, to the Judean wilderness. Jesus in Matthew 24 said, let those who are in Judea, when this happens, flee uh, to, the, to the mountains. And again, that wilderness is full of, of mountains. Notice it's a place that is particularly pr uh, prepared by, by God. Uh, that phrase only appears one other time in the New Testament. It's in John 14. I go to prepare a place for you. I'm talking about again, believers in heaven. Now John, the same author, uses the exact same words to say, and God is now gone, will go to prepare a place for this remnant in the, in the wilderness. So there is that. There's also protection given to the remnant or the nation of Israel. It's divine protection. Uh, it's, uh, it's compared to that of wings, wings of an eagle. Now, one, one view is that uh, when they have to flee Jerusalem, there'll be several... Uh, C-17s waiting for them. There's a, 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 a SEAL team that has already set up a, a, an LZ there for them, and I'm sure there's a, a MU team in the area that's guarding the perimeter, and they're going to get them on. They're going to fly them off. There's a couple of A-10s flying close ground support, and there's probably a carrier group out there in the Persian Gulf. There'll be some F-18s up there. I'm trying to include everybody here. And, uh, and of course, at the other end, there's got to be a a Delta Force team that's uh, got the other area secure, and they've set up a perimeter. So I think I hit the, uh, the Air Force, Navy, <coughs> Navy, Marines. I can't figure out where the Coast Guard plays a role in this, but uh, that's one view. That's how they get out of there. Actually, that is a view that's in a book. It's not all of that, but uh, <coughs> I read about it and started cracking it up and thinking about it. Oh, of course, there would be an AWAC up there running the whole battle management thing as well. But uh, nonetheless, there's actually a view that the wings of the eagle represent the United States Air Force, and they're going to intervene to help them get out there. That's one view. But uh, again, to be consistent, everything in here has been a symbol. It's been a sign. So what is, what is the symbol in the Bible when it speaks of the wings of eagles? Has that been used before? Sure, it's been used uh, very specifically when God rescues the nation of Israel. Back in Exodus 19.4, there God says, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. So again, uh, it will be God's supernatural intervention. Satan is cast down. His man of the hour, the Antichrist, is running a one-world government. Persecution will break out. And again, Jesus said, when you see these things happening, and he gave some things to look for, if you're Jewish and you're in Israel, you're in Jerusalem, you flee and you get out of there as fast as you can uh, and a remnant of Jews will be able to do that. The phrase water as a flood, again, not explained, but, but uh, we have a reference to something similar to that in Psalm 124. There it says, if it, had not been the, uh, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us, they would have swallowed us alive when their wrath was kindled against us. The waters would have overwhelmed us. The stream would have gone over our soul. And uh, that psalm, again, goes on and talks about God's faithfulness in protecting his people in times when evil comes against them. It's like a flood that's going to overtake them. Now, literally, that flood probably is the military might of the Antichrist and his one world government. It's all under the control of, uh, of Satan. This thing really does get lived out. There are supernatural things that are going on, but it lives, gets, lives out in, in the physical realm that we live in 
But the whole point is that they are protected, they are there, nourished by God, cared for by God for three and a half years. And, uh, and the conflict of the ages is, is that, that God has a redemptive plan for mankind. It directly and specifically involved the nation of Israel, the woman, because she would give birth to the Messiah, Jesus. And Satan tried to stop that birth. He would stand there waiting. God would not allow it because God's plan of saving us is going to happen. That didn't happen, so now he waits and does what he can to prevent the Messiah from coming back a second time. Now he's unable to do it. This remnant of believers are, are out there, protected, provided by God. And again, he's just a little bit ticked off at this. So in verse 17, the dragon was enraged with Israel. Let's just say that. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, the rest of the Jewish people who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of, uh, of Jesus Christ. So at this point, and, and we know from other passages of Scripture, and we'll get there, there will be a horrific holocaust against the Jews, and two-thirds of the Jewish population on the planet Earth will be killed by the Antichrist forces at that time. It'll just be a, a, a horrific time, and of course, Gentile believers are being, being killed, and that's already been discussed and already been covered but uh, just a, uh, a frightening thing that will take, take place in, uh, in the future. So uh, very, you know, again, to study these things, it's good to know what's going to be happening in the future. I guess it's my, uh, my prayer, my desire that uh, we would absolutely believe God's word and what it says. And we would realize that, you know, this is all going to come to culmination very soon. Uh, and that uh, in the final analysis, the only thing that's really going to matter is, again, how many men and women and children that go to heaven with us. Uh, I'm hoping that it'll, that, uh, it'll uh, affect us, affect our prayer life, uh, affect how we might share our testimonies uh, with others and look for those opportunities, look for the opportunities to uh, share the, the gospel with others. Uh, but it, uh, it should change us knowing what's, what's uh, happening in the future. And I, I've used the illustration before, but uh, uh, again, uh, just to kind of emphasize here, you know, driving to work one day, coming across the, uh, the little uh, gap at the top there, when you cross Oneava Ridge uh, back over here, was coming to the top, and, and uh, there was a guy with a weed whacker up there, and uh, he saw me coming up the hill, Callahale High School is down at the bottom there, where it goes very quickly from a 35 to a 25, very quickly, uh, and he was at the top of the wheel with his weed whacker, working on the side, and he, he saw me coming, and he stopped, and he started doing this. <laughs> He was prophesying. <laughs> From his vantage point, he could look into my future <laughs> and tell me what was coming. If I understood the symbolism, I did. I looked at my speedometer very closely, and, and sure enough, I needed to slow down just a little as I came across the crest of that hill and then down onto the bottom. Sure enough, there was a, a guy down there with one of those things that looks like a, a black hair, hair dryer with no cord on it, and he was uh, down there doing that. And, uh, and what he said to me about the future changed my behavior. I kind of recheck the dial to see where I was at. Uh, and I was really glad that I did because there would have been consequences, you know, had I, had I not. And I think certainly that's one of the reasons that God tells us and says, I can stand in a place and see, and I want you to know what's coming ahead. And of course, it's, I think it's his desire that we'd be changed as a result. I